This is Peter Day's World of Business. I'm Peter Day. This week's download edition of Global Business from the BBC World Service comes from the USA. It's all about the Battle of the Business Schools. Two of the best-known business schools in the world stand on either side of the Charles River as it swells through Greater Boston in Massachusetts. The timeless courtyards of Harvard Business School are south of the river. A kilometre or two further down on the north bank, there's the equally imposing Sloan School of Management. It's part of Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Both have no difficulty in finding hundreds of students each year who pay tens of thousands of dollars to get their coveted MBA degrees. Many of the masters of business administration or in training here eventually go on to run huge banks and vast business institutions and famous consultancies all over the world. They become very powerful and they're going to be paid huge sums of money. But in the wake of business disasters such as the great financial crisis, Big questions are being asked about business education in general and about the mighty top business schools in particular. Even Harvard is reassessing its power and influence. The most dangerous place for any organization is actually when it's at the top because it runs the risk of not being attuned to, attentive to changes that take place in the environment, almost assuming that changes in the environment will readily translate into continued leadership. That's the new dean of Harvard Business School who's made some significant changes to this famous curriculum. Nitin Noria was born in India, but he's no newcomer to Harvard. He's been teaching here for 25 years. This is the institution famous for basing much of what it teaches on the 90-year-old case studies method, real company problems on which HBS students spend months of their university lives producing responses to. But now he's Dean Nitin Noria has decided it's time to reduce the reliance on case studies and instead send his MBA students out into the world to study not casebook examples but real-life problems. A big step. Perhaps it's one prompted by the realisation that many outsiders have put at least some of the blame for the financial crisis on the slickness and self-confidence exuded by the MBA graduates with the top business school education. Nitin Noria again. It turned out that there was a great coincidence that happens sometimes that causes a period of deep introspection for an institution. So for us, it was the financial crisis in which people were saying, in what ways are business institutions and business schools like us responsible? We had to take account of that. So we went out and studied as many of the failure cases as we saw to try and understand what we could do. So the combination of reflecting quite deeply on the crisis, but also this moment of 100 years, which you know these are moments when you do have to reflect, led to a lot of rethinking about what the future of the MBA needed to be. Yeah, because what do you get as an MBA student or as an MBA graduate? You get a elite networking, very, very, very important. You get a set of tools and language. You get a lot of case studies in the case of Harvard. You get much more money when you graduate. And you get huge self-confidence, which I think is a very damaging addition to all the good things I've just mentioned. So I don't believe that. I actually think that there's a big difference between self-confidence and hubris. You always want people to have self-confidence, but there's nothing incompatible between having self-confidence and having humility. I deeply believe that one of the things that we're trying to now do for our students, for example, this global immersion that we've introduced, the field courses that we've introduced, are all examples of saying, look, in the case method, you can sit in the classroom and put yourself in the shoes of the CEO and say, if I was CEO, this is what I would do. And it's easy to allow yourself to believe that just because you said it, you could actually do it. Now we want to actually put you out back into the world and say, let's see, see what a muddled, can. dirty yeah. nuisance of a place it is. Yeah, and teach you a little bit more of that humility. The idea of these changes is that Harvard Business School will now combine traditional case studies with on-the-spot encounters. HBS uses the acronym FIELD for the process. It stands for Field Immersion Experience for Leadership Development. So how's it going, this big change in business education? Two HBS students told me about their recent experiences. My name is Alison Williams and I'm a first-year student at HBS. And you've got a lot of degrees and stuff. 
Yes, I have an undergraduate degree in pharmacology from King's College London and then a PhD from the National Heart and Lung Institute, which is part of Imperial College London. And this was an itch to actually get things done rather than just be lab-bound and lab-based. Absolutely. My bosses came in and they said, you know, I've woken up at 2am in the morning thinking of an experiment to do, you know, we must do it right now. And I was waking up in the middle of the night thinking, you know, why don't we have a therapy for this? Why aren't we commercialising these technologies faster? in more leaner ways than traditional big pharma. So one way to perhaps answer these solutions is to train more scientists in business expertise. That's a nice idea. Your field trip, what did that do for you? It was amazing. I was in Malaysia. It was my first trip to Asia and I worked for a company called Malaysia SME whose core competency was a business newspaper focused on small to medium-sized businesses. There's no absolute answers in the real world, are there? Absolutely, and that's something as a scientist I was particularly uncomfortable with because I always wanted more data and more experiments. And, you know, I've realised in business you don't have that luxury. So it really does push you over the edge to, you know, make a decision, test it, try, iterate, you know, if it doesn't work, pitch it, try something else. You are? Sergio Marrero, and I am a joint degree student with the Harvard Kennedy School of Government and the Business School. Where did you go on your field trip? I was in Chongqing, China. So we were working for a company at CSC. It's a food franchise. And what we were doing is increasing off-peak hour sales. What do you suggest? How do you do it? Specific to the local Chongqing, what we ended up recommending for them is they actually thought they were competing with the European and Western food chains when they were actually competing with local street vendors. So we actually told them they should copy what the local street vendors were doing and and go out and bring some of their local food. And you were there for how long? We were there for 10 days. That's quite an insight to come up with in 10 days. It's fairly fundamental to their business. It is. It was amazing to not only dive in and get beyond the, it's not about what bringing American ideas to them or Western ideas, it's about understanding what they need and coming up with realistic business solutions. From students getting hands-on experience of the business world, back to Dean Nitin Noria. How does this real-life immersion replace what HBS students used to learn from that case study methodology? It's not like we took away our case method classes. They're all still going on in parallel. But you're also introducing things like psychology, group behavior, relationship to new cultures, an understanding of actually advancing an idea and how bruising it may be in the circumstances. You're introducing quite a lot of new stuff that hasn't really been covered at Harvard in the MBA course before, aren't you? Absolutely. And there's a whole act of doing and being which includes all these things. How do you relate to people? If your team ends up getting into difficulty, how do you get yourself out of that difficulty? So when you talk to the students and you say, what do we actually learn from this process? The students will talk about how much they learned about what it means to be a good team player, what it means to encounter an unfamiliar country for the first time and have their views changed. Like, I thought I knew what an emerging market was. But boy, some of these places feel more modern. I mean, you know, their definition of an emerging market is maybe what my country looked like in the 1950s. So people end up having their worldview in very important ways changed as a result of this experience. And, you know, when they come back from this global immersion, we ask them to do yet another imaginative thing, right? So we're asking them to all build a micro business in the next 14 weeks. So here they're launching an idea that a company had for what it might introduce. Now we're saying, why don't you think about your own idea? The point is to have our people learn what an execution cycle on any idea looks like. What we want to teach them is even in a very modest scale project, execution is hard. 1% inspiration, 99% perspiration. You're teaching them the perspiration. Absolutely. And that's what students discover very quickly, that so much of the seduction of entrepreneurship is if I have a great idea, that's the path to riches. And what people realize is, my God, the distance between a great idea and a great product is a big, big distance. The reality gap, as seen by Dean Nitin Noria. One notable critic of the Harvard Business School experience is the British writer Philip Dells Broughton. He wrote Ahead of the Curve, What They Teach You at Harvard Business School, after completing the two-year MBA course a few years ago. 
The book recounting his experiences provoked strong reactions from Harvard and from his fellow alumni. So I wondered what Philip Dells Broughton made of the go-out-and-do-it changes HPS is now making in the way it teaches business. You have to look at what exactly going out and doing it actually means in that context. I think when a real entrepreneur looks at that, they will see nothing more than it's like the Fisher-Price version of entrepreneurship. You sit in a lavishly endowed glass building and play with blocks and claim to be an entrepreneur. That's nothing close to what being a real entrepreneur is like. And I think when real entrepreneurs look at that, that's exactly what they think. That's the kind of flaw in this. Is it just window dressing? You know, entrepreneurship is very hot right now. And it cuts to the much bigger trends here, which have much more to do than sending a lot of already highly privileged 27-year-olds for a few weeks to India which is that the nature of general management is changing. The process of outsourcing, which started right at the bottom of the business hierarchy with things like accounting, so sort of payroll services, is gradually inching ever further upwards, eating away at jobs that were once regarded as white-collar and untouchable. And it's getting to the point where the old-fashioned MBA jobs can now be done for much less money elsewhere. And I think you're seeing this in the kinds of salaries MBAs are getting. The industries that are being eaten away, financial services, used to be an absolute safe haven for MBAs. All that's happened there in the past five years is jobs have been cut, jobs have been moved overseas. And I think the MBA program's really questioning their worth. That's what this is really about. I don't know whether the field is going to be effective or not, but the underlying neurosis there is the right one, which is we're no longer as relevant and useful as we were 20, 30 years ago, even six or seven years ago. And this process is only accelerating. But do you think HBS is just tinkering with its courses, do you? This isn't just about HBS. I think fundamentally, if you were a 23-year-old, a smart 23-year-old, 24-year-old, wondering, do I go get an MBA? There are a few issues that are going to leap out at you. One is that this is an enormously expensive degree, and it just seems to be getting more expensive at a rate faster than inflation. And that doesn't include the opportunity cost of this foregone salary. A lot of MBA students, perhaps not at Harvard or Stanford, but a lot of the other schools, are really struggling to find jobs. Salaries aren't, aren't increasing at a rapid rate. So the debt burden is going up. The rewards at the end of it are going down. And so why would you go? And we all know, and this is, a, you know, everyone will tell you, you know, if you meet so older business people, they say, oh, if I was starting out today, I'd, I'd head straight to Shanghai or Mumbai. I'd, I'd head east. That's where all the growth is. And then the question is, well, why not just go there? Go and get your MBA over there rather than going to an American school and playing some sort of, you know, dress up every now and again and going off on these field trips. Actually go to Xinhua, go to a business school in India, make your networks there. If that's genuinely where you believe growth is, then that's where you should go. That's the kind of existential problem that all these Western MBA programs face is they're too expensive. They're not particularly useful in the way they were. And so all you're left with is these kind of nebulous things like networks and clubs and who you meet. And that's just pure elitism. That's the problem they face. Strong reservations from Philip Dells Broughton, author of What They Teach You at Harvard Business School. This is Global Business from the BBC World Service. I'm Peter Day, this week hearing about two famous business school rivals only a kilometre or two apart in Greater Boston, USA. Now let's take a journey down the river to that other famous institution, MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. The MIT Sloan School of Management is named after one of the greatest American management geniuses, Alfred P. Sloan, the architect of General Motors. The Sloan School is based in a university bursting with entrepreneurial and technology talent, but it is also finding ways of bringing entrepreneurship to the fore as part of its MBA experience. In the Sloan School lobby, I encountered a huge world map showing where students have carried out projects, explained by MIT's Paul Denning. There's a wall in the main building at the Sloan School demonstrating how out in the world you are. Right. The students want to work on these projects because it does give them on-the-ground, hands-on experience in solving a major problem in a business, something that they're here to actually learn how to do. So these are developing world problems they're trying to find some kind of solutions for. What kind of things? For instance, a project in Colombia developing eco-friendly alternatives for home and personal care products. In Kenya, improving management of one of Kenya's first rural hospices. The Global Health Delivery Project in South Africa, increasing access to vital educational materials for youth in 900 sites across the country. India, increasing the serving of healthy meals to more than 5 million school children. Now these are projects worked on by who? By our students, by our MBAs. 
and it's called a lab because everything at MIT is some kind of lab. This is the Global Global Entrepreneurship Laboratory, and there's uh, variations of that, which can be the Global Health Delivery Lab, India Lab, China Lab. Everything has a lab attached to it because that's what students at MIT do. They analyze things within a laboratory mind frame, and then they try to come up with solutions to what the problems are. The Sloan School didn't get its name until 1950, but its origins in engineering administration make it only slightly younger than Harvard Business School. It'll be celebrating its centenary next year. So how is Sloan responding to big changes in the 21st century business world? David Schmidtlein is the Sloan School Dean. The role of innovation, small companies, entrepreneurial companies, is probably the largest difference in the way the school operates now. But another big difference is the way we teach students through project-based learning on a global scale. Giving them opportunities to pull and push levers in organizations uh, is a very different way to learn. It's different from cases. It's different from lectures. Uh, Over the last 20 years, that's really transformed the experience here. Do you teach entrepreneurship? We create an environment where someone who wants to learn to be a successful entrepreneur can. Because, again, it slightly sticks in the craw that business schools are now rather interested in teaching or getting involved with entrepreneurship, and yet surely the great entrepreneurs don't need much of a business school background and haven't had it in the past. Certainly some people can be successful entrepreneurs without a business school background. No one should argue uh, that point. If you want to be an entrepreneur, uh, certainly knowing, I think, a bit of accounting, uh, marketing, how customers are likely to respond to a new product, finance to create the foundation for a new venture, those things can be valuable. But even beyond all of that, think about what kind of entrepreneur you want to be. Do you want to be an entrepreneur who has an idea and early on sells out to a big firm? Or do you want to be an entrepreneur who builds a company? If you want to build a company, you have to know how to manage people. Most individuals, through instinct alone, run aground on the rocks on the issues of managing people. David Schmidtlein, Dean of the Sloan School of Management at MIT. I wonder what Philip Dells Broughton, Harvard Business School graduate and critic, made of the rival institution just down the river. The MIT, you know, the Sloan School was always slightly the ugly sister to Harvard, but I think that's changed in recent years. They've really got ahead in terms of marrying all the other things that are going on at MIT, whether it's, you know, in the engineering school, computer science, biotech, the media lab, and really opened the doors of the business school and said, all of you lot, you know, if you want to commercialize what you're doing, we'll help you do that. And for the business school students, it gives them access to smart people with great ideas that they can build businesses around. Whereas the Harvard Business School was very much an island unto itself. It didn't have deep relationships with the rest of Harvard University. And I think now they're trying to stoke that, but they're late in the game on this. And I think MIT has done a much better job. And I think you're seeing that. If you're an ambitious engineer who wants to build a business, Sloan would make a lot more sense in terms of having those two cultures actually married in one place. I I hear that again and again. What do current Sloan School students feel about what they're learning there? Part of an institution, MIT, better known for visionary science and technology than business graduates. I asked some of them, starting with Omid Zadakpur from Chile and Ecuador, a second-year MBA student with a background in software. Currently, I'm trying to start a company that's aiming to help with the discoverability of people based on the topics that they research and based on the departments that they work in, based on their hobbies, based on where they're from. So you could very easily find someone at MIT that's from Brazil, does yoga, is gluten-free, and is researching material science. Sort of Facebook for MIT, is it? Yeah, you could think about Facebook, but with very specific MIT qualities. When did you think up this idea? During your MBA study? I came to MIT to start something, and the first problem you see is you can't find people. I mean, specific people. So then I started programming it. I showed it to some students, some professors. It kind of evolved with the feedback that I got, and it became what it is. But I think MIT in particular focuses on these big engineering problems. And from a engineer that's very exciting to be able to study business but to then be able to work with the engineers here as well it's worth the money is it it's a lot of money it's a, it's a lot of money and it's even riskier when you're trying to start a company for me it's more about impact and you just leave the money thought aside you just try to ignore that as much as you can <laughs> Hi, I'm Lucy Zhao. I'm born in Beijing and raised in Canada. 
I'm actually here at MIT doing a degree in Master's of Science and Management Studies. It's a post-MBA, it's a one-year degree. Why did you apply to Sloan in particular? Well, Sloan in particular because of this particular program. This one-year program that I'm in actually has a prerequisite of you have to get your Master's in Business degree outside of the U.S., so I went outside the oh, U.S. It was designed for you, wasn't it? Yes, it was like the oh, perfect... you went to get your degree with this course in mind? Yes, I did. It's like two, three years in the making. But in essence, I wanted that international experience. I wanted to go back to China, go back to my roots, and then come here to really get into entrepreneurship, which I did. Why do you want to be an entrepreneur? I think it's just that drive that you have, that every effort that you put in, is for some greater end goal in your life. And a lot of the times when I worked for other corporations, and I did that for about three and a half years, it just didn't seem like I had a lot of value to give. And with startups, you know, you're working in small teams of, you know, two to four, and you're very, very collaborative. Everything that goes into your work, you can really feel the result of it. And that's a complete rush on its own, I think. And I wouldn't mind being rich either. Yeah, that's a nice bonus, I think, on top of that. (laughs) How about that feeling that you can pin at least part of the blame for the financial crisis on how business schools teach and the self-confidence they instill in their MBA graduates? I put my reservations to David Schmidtlein, the Sloan School Dean. It's a valid concern for all programs and a valid criticism for some. Hubris is an issue everywhere. It's an issue in the public sector. It's an issue in the elite managerial class. How does an organization that tries to educate individuals help guard against hubris, help guard against the sense that you know more than you do? One of the things you can do is talk about how much you know and how much you don't know. Another thing you can do is put people in situations that overwhelm them and lead them to judge whether they know what they're doing or don't know what they're doing. And a third thing you can do is put them inside an organization where they know that they're not the smartest person on campus. They're not even in the 100 smartest people on campus. Those are the math majors over in the other part of MIT. But this issue that you raise is one that we worry about. And ethics and all that, you've got time to teach that, sending all these people out all the time? We do do ethics modules, as our peer schools do. You know, I have to say, in that realm of ethics, I think it's important to help give people a language to use around a moral compass that we certainly hope that they bring with them. If anybody has an educational program for 28-year-old people, if that 28-year-old is a lying liar who lies, I don't know what you're going to do in an ethics course to change that. We work very hard to try to screen out of our program people who are ethically challenged coming in. That's not a perfect science itself. But for people who do have a compass, we help them give voice to it. The big question for the Harvard MBA and author Philip Dells Broughton. Does he think that people pondering their career prospects should go for a business school education? There was a video that came out the past couple of weeks, Bill Gates and Mark Zuckerberg and all these people talking about the best thing you could do is learn to code. And I think there's a lot of truth to that. There's going to be an enormous gap and need for developers. If I was someone wanting to set up a business, the vast majority of new businesses these days have a huge technology component. The first thing I'd want to learn about would be technology rather than accounting or finance or any MBA skills. That's what I want to learn about first. Then would I go and get a Harvard MBA? I'd have a hard look at the cost of this thing. There are so many options now that just didn't exist, even five or ten years ago. And you can put together a really first-rate business education for yourself at a fraction of the cost, get to know the right people, move to the right place. That alternative exists now in a way it didn't until very, very recently. And I, I think that's what I advise any smart person to do. In this highly competitive field, how does the dean of the MIT Sloan School view the evolution of Harvard Business School just across the river? We're very proud of Harvard Business School's dean, Nitin Noria, who's an MIT Sloan School alum. His PhD (laughs) is from Sloan. But otherwise, deep rivalry? Certainly, we compete with each other for students. We compete with each other for faculty. But more fundamentally, it's important for America and I think for the world that there be hubs of innovation that are lively, that are active, and that are substantial in scale. And when we think about the Boston region more broadly, 
I want Harvard Business School to do well in the realms of innovation and entrepreneurship because we all benefit when the ecosystem here is strong. There's a terrific rivalry among the leading business schools to hire the most prominent professors and to be close to the top of the much-followed annual ranking tables in which the pay graduates can command is heavily weighted. On the Financial Times 2013 Global MBA table, Harvard is ranked number one and MIT Sloan number nine. The highest-ranked non-American institution is the London Business School. It's number four. I asked Dean Nitin Doria at Harvard if league table pressure skewed the way they actually ran their institutions. As often happens when you have competition, what used to be innovative in the past becomes commoditized very quickly. That's the nature of what competition does. So I believe that the base of business education is rapidly getting commoditized. If all you teach people is the conceptual vocabulary, the language of business. There was a time when Harvard Business School was amongst the few places where you could do that, and so that was a distinctive skill to just do. Now everybody teaches cases, everybody can teach the language of business. When I became dean, I felt that we could not just afford to do business as usual. The landscape is more competitive. The opportunities are more demanding. Our students will need to be better prepared. And we have to do more to prepare them and to continue to have people believe that coming to Harvard Business School provides you the best, most distinctive education relative to other alternatives, which are sometimes cheaper and sometimes can be done part-time. That's the game that I think everybody who's in management education has to, in some ways, play. And as the leader in the field, we have to raise the game for ourselves and for others. You want to be just like MIT? I came from MIT. I want to be better than them. (laughs) Dean Nitin Noria of Harvard Business School, one of the formidable and expensive places which young people struggle to get into in order to create career paths and learn more about business. Of course, they could always stay at home and listen to this program, but maybe it wouldn't be quite the same thing.